Hi, welcome to um, this week's um, episode of, what is it, The Wellbeing Show, there you go. That's my brain just switched off immediately there. <laughs> How many years have I been saying that line and I still, I fluffed it? Well done, Noel. Um, so I've got some great guests on this evening. Um, Leslie, hi, and Anna, hi. Um, and you can introduce yourselves with your full list of titles and the spaghetti alphabet thing that comes at the end of your names. It's always quite impressive, to be honest, um, seeing that. Um, and I'm... Just saying that because I'm completely intimidated, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> both are doctors, um, and Leslie has been at very senior levels in the NHS and currently in the Lords, and has just written an awesome book, which is winging its way to me, called Patients First, How to Save the NHS. So we're going to save the NHS tonight, apparently. So we haven't got very long to do it, so we should really crack on. And Anna has um, is a junior doctor um, who has... Uh, graciously admitted herself into the NHS to give her her skills and experience um, and is just currently doing her psych rotation. Um, so um, it's great to have you both here. Um, and I just want to say, hi, Anna, how are you doing? How was your day at work? It was good, actually. I had a, a very nice day at work. I do not always say that at the end of a day of work. Sure. Um, <laughs> was, today really was a very nice day. Great. And how about you, Leslie? Were you in the Lords today? Or? I was in the Lords today. How did that go? Not for very long, because I had other things to do, but I was there to listen to the Foreign Minister talk about various things that are going on in the world which are very uncomfortable. Yeah, oh, that's, it's quite a frightening world to be in. Oh, uh, horrendous, horrendous. Yeah. But he was very good. He was very good. Yeah. And that's maybe we'll start with that. We'll start with that sort of general sense in which um, the, um, there is quite a frightening world at the moment. I come, I guess, from the psychological aspects and I was writing um, um, a press release the other day around uh, from World Mental Health Week and looking at that 30% of patients who turn up to GP um, surgeries on a regular basis with unspecified physical illnesses, which we all know and the research evidence shows is from um, mental health issues that have not been supported or explored properly. Um, and I guess that is what we're dealing with here. And sort of in the context of um, some of the issues around sick note culture and stuff like that. Um, I, it might be useful to go back to the days before the NHS, which um, some of us might be able to remember, um, not Anna, certainly, but, um, certainly, if, I'll give you an anecdote of mine. I remember my mum, um, bless her, she was a sort of working class Irish lady who never asked for anything, to be honest, immigrant, um, came over to England in the 50s. Um, and she grew up in a country without health services um, and where to ask for um, the doctor's help um, was very expensive, genuinely very expensive. And um, so she was afraid of asking for the doctor. And um, eventually my mum died. She died quite young of cancer. And maybe it was preventable, I don't know. But she was one of those, that generation, that wouldn't ask for medical help because of fear of the expense. And so she lived in agony for about a year, I would say. Um, and eventually we, we noticed she held it away. And eventually she got to the point where she couldn't hide it anymore. And so we called her doctor, the doctor came out. And she hadn't. She sort of forgotten she was in England. <laughs> she had the NHS and it wasn't it cost any money. Um, and it said that she had bowel cancer and it was too far gone to help her. So they gave a great end of life care. Sad story. But it's that generation. I think we might forget that story in terms of the NHS and where it came about. Um, how did you get involved in the NHS, Leslie, yourself? What, what drew you into it? Well, I'm, I'm very old now, as you, as you know, but I wasn't here before the NHS. I went to medical <laughs> in 1952. Right. Uh, and graduated in 1957. I'm 90 years old now. So well done. I do remember the early days of working in the health service when we couldn't do a great deal for our patients. I mean, the sorts of treatments we had available were somewhat limited. There was no heart transplantation. There was no hip replacement. There was no... Uh, endoscopies, there was no uh, drugs for various diseases that we treat now. Childhood leukemia was universally fatal. And so there have been dramatic changes 
that I've seen over my lifetime. Uh, but in the early days, uh, I enjoyed myself. When I became a young houseman in 1957, 58, uh, it was great fun. I was, I was, I was trained in a way which would be illegal now. <laughs> I was left on my own for <laughs> to struggle on, which I I really enjoyed. I liked to take oh. responsibility, uh, but I really wasn't uh, fit to do that. I wasn't trained. It's remarkable that they allowed us to do that. Uh, but of course, uh, things have changed. So I, I remember the early days. Uh, and watching people with heart failure and the uh, artery disease was very common. We used to treat patients with a heart attack by putting them to bed for six weeks. <laughs> right, it's okay. Now we get them up and about, and, and many patients died from, from the emboli, from uh, uh, clots forming in the legs, going for the lungs, and uh, it was a a bad treatment, but that was what we thought was necessary. So okay. it's changed by the bit since. It's only recently, I think, that general sort of um, hospital policy is to get people out of bed. I think you were stuck in bed permanently yeah. because because they needed to mop the floors. I think <laughs> that was the possibility of, of angiography or angioplasty or stents or any of that. Yeah, they they weren't available. Yeah, they were what around. motivated you to go into healthcare? What was it that? Well, I could say that I wanted to save humanity, but that's not true. Okay. I, uh, you just I, did that in your spare time, I know. It's fine. It wasn't that, that at all. I, I was going to do become a pharmacist because I liked chemistry and I liked science. And I okay. Thought, and I thought pharmacists did that. But a friend of mine said, I'm going to go to medical school. And I thought, well, if he can do it, because I thought maybe I can. And that was why I went into medicine. And I had no idea what it was going to be like to be a doctor until I'd qualified. No one in my family before me had been to right. university. Right. No one in my family had been a doctor. Uh, we, were, we were lived in very poor circumstances in Salford, near Manchester. And uh, so I was the first to have that sort of possibility to go into medicine. It was only when I qualified, after I became a doctor, that I realized that this was the best thing possible for me it was fantastic wonderful it's, it's interesting i think that to think about the route out of you know a, a sort of humble background into uh professional training that was made available because of this new thing called the the nhs and the doctors and because up till then i guess the profession up until the state stepped in and started training people and offering training um, being a doctor would have been something that was beyond the reach of somebody from your background. It was. It was. It was. I, I'm Jewish, and uh, it was said at the time that Jew, Jews were would not get jobs in the main teaching hospitals, uh, which was true. I'd have to go into general practice, which wouldn't have been a terrible thing. Um, but uh, the other opportunities weren't open to me. It just so happened that in the 1950s and early 60s, Things changed, and that allowed me to help myself. So you faced quite a few bits of anti-Semitism and some obstacles there. Really, I didn't face anti-Semitism personally, um, but it was said that there are no Jews on the staff of the main teaching hospital, so there's no point in applying. Wow! Wow! It, it that changed. That changed. So, Anna, you were very much enmeshed in. Um, the modern NHS. He grew up in the in the UK, and um, what was your background? What was your route into wanting to train as a doctor and work for the institution? So I um I did not want to be a doctor when I left, yeah. <laughs> um partly because of the endless endless exams. Having been through quite a, I don't know, just felt like I was always doing exams growing up. Quite an intense um education. Uh, and so I did a degree in neuroscience because I have always been very interested in understanding people and wanted to understand kind of how the mind works and and, and all of that jazz. Um, and then I wasn't blown away <laughs> by my degree. Um, I don't think it kind of gave me the, the the sort of answers I thought I was I was looking for, I suppose. Um, 
and I ended up writing a dissertation on uh, using ketamine for depression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just did all this reading on, on how we were treating depression and, um, you know, obviously the, the big changes that had happened with the kind of monoamine theory and all of those drugs. And then actually in some ways, how far we hadn't come. Um, and because it was about ketamine, I was also then, you know, thinking about um, drug policy and, and recreational drug use and the impact that that has on people. And I decided that I really wanted to be a psychiatrist, uh, essentially. And <laughs> so then I went to five years of medical school um, and did a lot of hearts and lungs and, and kidneys and other bits, which thankfully I also found, you know, really interesting. Um, and obviously the core that, that, that runs through it all is the person that you are treating. And I think certainly the psychology and the psychiatry of it um, runs through kind of every every case and every presentation, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly what we see now as well in terms of the the impact that kind of how the world is going, um, the impact that has on our patients in terms yeah. of into them. So it's interesting both of you have a similar early starting story, if you like, in that you both were interested in the science of it. Mm. Um, the chemistry of it and then you got into the doctoring of it um and um Leslie what was that like becoming a doctor because it's not the training I guess um like I I'm aware that I didn't become a psychotherapist because I trained as one I sort of it was um beaten into me by my patients to be honest I have to say in my case because I'm a bit of a slow learner um what would you say is the difference between the training and then the experience when, when do you feel like you became a doctor, if, if you like. I was thrown in at the deep end, as I hinted. And I, as most trainees in those days, there wasn't much training. You gained your experience simply by doing the job. Yeah. And there was no specific training program as far as I can remember. But I loved it. And I was totally immersed in medicine living in a hospital for about two or possibly three years and hardly ever going out of the hospital. And it was a deep immersion experience and I loved it. It was uh, seeing patients the whole time, mixing with my colleagues, which was great fun, hmm. and the nurses, of course, and that, that life was, was very good to me. Uh, I didn't miss not getting out or not doing other things. And it was, a, as I said, a deep immersion. It was only later that I started getting engaged in research and wanting to do other things uh, and uh, taking on a research agenda and becoming more of an academic. But I never lost my work with patients. I was all, even when I was a professor of medicine, I had loads of patients and uh, were involved in teaching and dealing with patients. And that remained a main driver for me. And most of my research involved patients. Yeah, I remember my early days in the wards and the hospital settings. I worked in places like the Royal Ed up in Scotland. And uh, there was something very special about being in a hospital environment. That was a teaching hospital as well. Um, and th there was something very special about the sort of esprit de corps, the camaraderie, the um, sort of feeling with other colleagues. And also I remember... Uh, not intensity, but the learning experience. It was deeply um, interesting because there were so many really clever people around me. I would count myself as one of the really clever people. I learned so much yeah, um, from that immersion. I'm a bit of a sponge myself, to be honest. So what, tell me. what you're describing is the team spirit. Yeah. We had a, a tremendous team spirit in those days. And one of the things I talk about in my book is the way the team has disappeared. Right. That has produced uh, a lot of disheartening and disaffecting staff who feel that they're no longer part of teams. And that, that is a big problem. We have to bring back the team spirit, which you described so well. Yeah, yeah. You're nodding away there, Anna. Is that, does that yeah. resonate? Yeah, well, I'm very glad that, that Leslie said it. Um, because that's kind of what I was thinking when I um when I was listening really. Um 
you know, I'm I'm two years in. Um, in some ways, for our, the junior doctors now, we're we're more protected. You know, the the training is maybe more careful. There's there's all these kind of things that are there are in some ways positives. But you know, it's very fragmented. We're changing all the time. Even on a, you know, even when I'm in a single position, um, on a particular ward, the the turnover of the team is very rapid. Um, the kind of investment into like a single patient case I think is very different um and I know that the experiences that I've had that I've enjoyed the most were really when I was seeing things like medical on calls and you're doing a 13 hour night and you're there with this group of people and actually you do four nights together mm. uh, and <laughs> sometimes it's awful and you're exhausted but you you really get to kind of do the best that you can for people and go through something with your colleagues and that is always a time that I felt most like a doctor mm. uh, rather than sometimes like um sometimes a bit like a sort of highly paid administrator or... right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> which is fine but different but it's also that thread about the contact with the patient Leslie which you described you maintain your patient load and there's a is that still the case, do you think, in the NHS now, Leslie, that that one-to-one -one sort of relationship with the patient is there? I'm afraid not. Right. Um, I think, yeah, there are, there are many defects. Uh, one is the lock, lack of a team spirit, the loss of trust. I'll come back to the teams in a minute, because I want to explore that with you. A loss of trust, patients seem not to trust their doctors, the doctors don't trust each other, the doctors don't trust the nurses, and no one trusts the government. And uh, that permeates the way one works in the service. Mm -hmm. It's against the system, it seems. Mm -hmm. And um, I think patients do suffer because continuity of care is also lost. If you're seeing a GP now with big practices, uh, more efficient to have a big general practice uh, but if you're seeing a different doctor each time you lack the continuity of care that helps mm -hmm. patients particularly those with long-term illnesses and if you're in a hospital and you see a succession of new nurses and new doctors every day of the week you realize that you're not being cared for by someone who knows you well you have to explain something to them each day and that is very disheartening for patients. And it's very disheartening for the staff. As, the, as, as we, we've heard, you're losing the, the continuity of the people in the training programs, which are very fragmented in many instances. And the relationship between the head of department, the consultant, and the rest of the staff is intermittent. Mm -hmm. And although there is a formal training program, the part of the care that patients deserve is lost in the specifics of the training program. You have to get this level of experience for this, and you move on to the next load of experience, and you meet another set of trainers, and you meet another lot of nurses. I have quite a lot to say about nurses and doctors in, in the book because clearly, the staff are so essential if we're going to get good care for the patient. Mm -hmm. Staff are disillusioned. And if staff feel unnecessary and cogs in a wheel and don't feel as if they are supported and uh, deserve the, the level of help and support and, and underpinning that professionals expect, if they don't get that, they feel disillusioned, they feel, oh, well, well, what's the good news? And that's a very bad system for caring for patients. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll talk, because I have a company in the private sector, I liaise with the NHS quite a lot on with social services. And I would say, Leslie, and I can say this without worry about sort of being done for whistleblowing or anything like that. <laughs> that's a, sort of the, um, the esprit de corps that used to exist no longer exists in my relationship with people. Um, and I would say that my experience, this is of um, community mental health teams and also of hospitals, so um, patients that are going in under um, Mental Health Act admissions and so on. 
Um, but no two people are the same any one week. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like in terms of the professionals I'm dealing with, they're all locum, the, you know, nice enough people. Um, but, you know, I've had sort of um, MDTs, multidisciplinary teams, where somebody's literally reading the, the patient notes at the beginning of the meeting and sort of, and they're being asked to pontificate on the person. Um, and, but, you know, sort of, I'm thinking that's okay. Whereas if I, in my practice in the early days, and I'm a, I'm a dinosaur and, um, you know, I remember when pterodactyl still flew myself. Um, yeah. But... Um, the, the in in my day that would have been shocking that you sort of were reading notes and you didn't know anything about it and you couldn't be informed in an MDT about your patient people would have been genuinely shocked you know and and the professional actually would generally have said look I'm new I haven't read the notes so there's nothing to say for me I need to get to know this person and, and that would have been okay but pretending that you knew something when you didn't would have been shocking what does a team mean? I want to come back to this idea of what a team means, because it seems to me that we need to look at core processes that are not about the training, as you pointed out. It's not about the training. It's not about the technical level. And the technical level of skill, the technical level of training has definitely improved without a doubt. And the supervision, the structures for that, the safety mechanisms which need to be in place have definitely improved. But, but something's been lost. Yeah. Something's yeah. been lost in this care um, and this disenfranchisement um, and this sort of sense of fracturing. It seems to me that part of what that is are these teams and then the progression of patients, particularly patients with long-term conditions, which is what I deal with, and people knowing the patients and knowing something about them as human beings. So what is a team, do you think, Leslie? What is a team in the healthcare setting? Well, there's all sorts of teams. Um, there's teams in hospital, yeah. there's teams in the community, and they're different types. One of the problems I focus heavily on yeah. is that care in the community is on its knees. Oh, yeah. And social care... It's gone way beyond its knees, Leslie, to be honest. It's sort of in stumps at the moment. Part of, I mean, there's a whole set of reasons why that's the case. Yeah. And it's in the local authority. Uh, uh, they pay for it mostly, or individuals pay for it. And uh, local authority funding has been cut to the bone. Um, but the system in which care homes operate, most of which are privately owned, mm -hmm. they're distinct from the health service. It's a different system from the health service. And it's staffed by care workers who feel completely disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. The reason is, that care workers in homes are very poorly paid, we know that. Uh, they're paid less than they can get at Amazon or Tesco. Uh, and so they many leave within the first five months. And it's a very transient sort of job and transient staff. Some stay, of course, beyond the call of duty. But in that job, they are regarded as the dregs of the service. They don't have any potential for career progression. Mm -hmm. They don't have a nationally recognized training program or qualification. They're not registered. Mm -hmm. They're not represented by a union. They don't have what they should have as professionals. And we should be getting, and I've been pushing for years in the House and debates for the idea that we should be setting up a training program for them, recognized nationally, with a qualification at the end, a registration by a professional body, and then the potential for career progression. And that career progression could go into uh, into nursing, into associate nursing or assistant nursing. And that would make a reasonable job. But at the moment, it's not a job that anyone in 10 percent would want to go into. Mm -hmm. and it's 10 or 20 percent of the population of the staff are not there. It's very understaffed, very underpaid. So it's really not a very good career prospect. Mm -hmm. That is something that we really must do. And we could do it. We could uh, do it. You came forward on that, sort of. You seemed quite engaged in that and you were nodding away. Is that because you something you recognised? 
yeah I mean absolutely I mean I so I when I was in um did my first career I actually worked as a healthcare assistant in a care home for a year to decide if I wanted to be a doctor because I was like this is a big commitment yeah. um you know I want to be a psychiatrist but do I want you know what are the ins and outs going to be and I always thought from my experience of care that you know it was so it was so unbelievably undervalued you I spent more time with the patients as a healthcare assistant than I do as a doctor you know hands down um and I loved it to be honest I've loved parts of that job more than I've loved being a doctor in some ways because I you know there were lots of things I couldn't do couldn't change for people but I could spend some good kind of quality time with them that actually had a meaningful impact um uh and yeah I think it's just so it's like so unbelievably undervalued and the you know I think maybe realistically the way the world is going maybe our, our care workers are always now going to spend more time with patients than than doctors are and things and certainly the nurses spend obviously more time with patients than we do um and there's just such a big capacity to make a really big difference to patients there but it seems it, it's interesting because it seems like that what you're describing is a situation in which there is a them and us um, and there's a competition. There are these silos that exist um, and um, there is not much communication about the, the pathways that patients are on and communication within the hospital system, within the teams in the hospital and not much of a sense of belonging to something. Certainly when I started my career, I genuinely felt I belonged to something. Um, I genuinely felt I belonged to a project that was very important of national significance. And at that point of international significance, I felt very much that I was in a world leading service. Yeah, mm -hmm. and very much so. But that does not seem to be the message I'm getting now, that people are not feeling that emotional connection to it. I think that's right. Um, yeah, people are not, they're disaffected. Workers in the health service are disaffected, and certainly those in social care are. Uh, you ask about teams, what how we should try and produce teams in within hospital. Um, it's terrible to think back to my day as a as a no, it isn't. an old codger. <laughs> there's there's two of us here. It's all right. The old codgers are in the majority here. Don't worry. What I'm trying to get back, if we can, is some semblance of a team within the hospital which would include the nurse, the, uh, the head of the nursing, the nursing sister and her team, the consultant and his uh, trainee, and the possibility of them coming together twice a week, perhaps, to discuss all their patients and to have a ward round. Yeah. It seems to me that what is happening more and more is individual consultants and individual trainee doctors go around separately and the nurses wander in and wander out. And uh, sometimes the nursing sister, sometimes the associate nurses, some, you know, uh, someone comes in. But they, it's rare for a patient to see the group all knowing everything about that particular patient. And in my day, we did. We always had a team with a nursing sister, a consultant, that's another consultant, and two or three trainee doctors, and perhaps another nurse too. And everyone went round, everyone saw every patient, they all knew everything about those patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. now it has to be handed on one to the other it's not in a team it's not continuous mm -hmm. and so we have to get back to that somehow I've been suggesting for some time that the hospital medical staff need to get back to having a regular meeting that, that seems to have disappeared but we used to have staff meetings I don't think staff meetings exist at least we can do they're not common What's happened in hospitals, it's very unusual for them to have capacity to get meals after hours. If you're on night duty. Yeah, well, I remember the report on that one. Yeah, definitely. Out of the machines. And, and yeah. 
opportunities, and there's no uh, way of getting you can send out for a pizza, but there's no possibility of having catered catering the way during the day, and there's no staff canteen. There's usually a patient canteen which staff go to. It's a it's it's the staff are neglected basically. And mm -hmm. Start thinking about how to get together with them. Mm -hmm. I don't think about all what I've said, but I'm just an old project. Well, no, I think it's all very true. Um, yeah. It did remind. I mean, in my first rotation, um, I uh, I had a consultant, and um, did he do a ward round every day? I can't remember. But we had to present the patient. That, you know that we and we would have we'd have our pharmacist we'd have the, the head nurse would come around with us and it was amazing and I was terrified for the first <laughs> couple of weeks because we get told off when we um made mistakes um but it was an unbelievable learning experience and you did and you just and then you put the effort in to to learn about the patient to learn to present well um and that was amazing and even though I was a bit um scared at times but I, I I did get over that but, but I was a little bit nervous at times um I found it more fulfilling than not having that and feeling a bit more disconnected um and and having different people all the time um and you know being on jobs where you do a ward round uh and then you might have a weekly meeting with the whole team but again you wouldn't know who would or, or wouldn't be coming um and doing a ward round and then having to try and make sure that you've handed over specific things to the nursing team or to the OT or to the, and it all becomes this quite disparate thing. Mm -hmm. And so, what's it like being in that as an individual? How do you experience yourself? Then? Um, I think it does make me feel slightly more disconnected um, right. in the job. I think you feel, I think you feel more isolated. Yeah. Um, and um i mean in the in a funny way you feel almost more accountable because you're thinking oh god you know am i the only person that has this in my head right now i mean obviously not my jenny the consultant obviously knows what's going on but after a ward round if you've missed something or you know blah 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 um but at the same time also i think definitely kind of slightly detached right yeah, yeah. and a lot of pressure it sounds like as well i mean there's a thing about i remember from teams again i remember sort of being embarrassed if I got things wrong in the team. But um, I never felt like the team was my enemy. Mm. It's there. It was OK. I would make mistakes and people would tease me about it, afterwards, especially the nurses, because nurses are genetically designed to tease everybody on the planet. That's the way they are. It's the way they're born. Um, and um, but that was OK. And you would just get teased in the nursing station. Um, and it was all good fun. But um, the idea, because I've worked in quite, you know, with psychotic and um, psychopathic patients who've done quite dangerous things. So, you know, seriously, you would not want to be on your own in that. But this sort of psychic isolation that you seem to be talking about, you're inside your own head. There isn't a feeling that there's somebody to turn to, mm. even if that might be complicated and challenging. I, I mean, I think it's quite, I don't want to paint too unfair a picture because yeah. I think it's, it's quite varied, you know, that I've done um, for, you know, people who maybe don't know the, the the system, you do your first two years, you rotate every four months um, going through different jobs. So, it, you know, it can be quite varied. Um, but I mean, even that, I don't know, I don't know what the training used to be like, but um, I, I mean, I, the nurses, all the nurses I've worked with are fantastic and I learned very quickly that the best thing you could do as a as a first year doctor is just ask the nurses what's going on. <laughs> if you don't know how something works, or you know, I don't know, funny discharge things or ward protocols, or you know, they are you know often have so much more experience and have been on that ward for far longer than you have. A lot of them, um, but I think it must be quite hard. And I don't again, as you you can tell me if this has changed. I I don't know, and I, I can see why we need to go through different jobs and and try different things and learn different things. But also to have your juniors rotating every four months must also sometimes be frustrating, I guess. Yes, I think the um, the training used to be much longer. It used to be six months. Right? Mm -hmm. 
two lots of six months in the first year, and then it's what was called an SHO. Mm. Uh, for four or six months or two one year training. I, I my personal feeling is that four months is too short. Mm. To know someone and to train somebody. But it was lost because people felt there's a need to explore the next experience as possible. So mm. or the, the extra stage. And I don't suppose we'll be able to go back to that now. But uh, I uh, do think that the rotations are too short to really get to know as much as one could. It gives you a taste of it. It gives you a bit of taste so you feel, well, that sounds like an interesting thing. I want to spend more time in it. But uh, otherwise, uh, I don't. I think they're too short, those kind of programs. Mm. Yeah, your comment about the nurses is, is very important. I, I have a. I think about the nurses in the book, and uh, I have the utmost regard for the nursing profession and, and the way they handle things are terrific. Uh, but it all went wrong when they went completely over to two things. One is uh, the nursing training hierarchy and uh, the university education. The university education for all nurses was invaluable and it made it produced a, a very professional profession who knew their stuff and could do all sorts of very important things, but many of which uh, instead of doctors, and, and they're, they're very good at it. But it left a big gap in the, the caring side. Yes, yeah, no, I get that. Capable of caring, they are. I mean, they're very competent individuals. They are, their eyes on specialism, and this the caring was always supported by what were called state and rural nurses. We lost those in this rush for the university education, and uh, they've been taken more recently by uh, assistant nurses and associate nurses. Mm -hmm. But it's not well publicized, it's not well supported. But that's where much of the nursing that caring was. Changing beds, feeding patients, toileting them, all the caring things that are needed to be done could be done by, uh, doesn't need a university education to do that. And that's why I think we need to make sure that we have sufficient of the nurses that are not necessarily going to specialize. Yeah. Another group of individuals. The other thing is the career progression. No sooner has a nurse become in charge of a ward, a nursing sister, she spends two or three years in that post before moving on uh, up the ladder because there are many career grades beyond the nursing sister level. Uh, teaching, administration, organization, running several wards, and they're very attractive. They have different grades and they're paid more. So the nursing sister which is a key position in charge of a wall of a patient, making sure that she knows all the patients and runs it like a battleship. Nursing sisters. Like I remember them. Who were, who were I met one or two of those in my life. They were the ones that junior doctors used to turn to all the time. Definitely. And they felt in charge. We've lost the capacity for an authoritative person the same post as a nursing sister, mm -hmm. incidentally, is to make the nursing sister a much more attractive post for a continuing position. Rather like a consultant, once they've been made a consultant, stick at that level. They don't wander off to other posts. Some of them do, but very few. Most of them have got career grade posts. Career grade nursing sister should be the aim, and we should pay them accordingly. Mm -hmm the right level of support and funding and salary that is in this important position. Mm -hmm. This charge of the ward is vitally important for the way the ward runs. Yeah. And on whom everyone can rely. We don't seem to have that quite so much as we do. They're, they're off at the ladder. It, well, it's sort of, they, they set a tone and a culture, right? And that's what we're talking about. The other thing I think we're talking about, and... Um, 
and please shoot me down in flames because I'm coming from my own sort of um, um, sort of specialism, if you like. Is it seems to me I grew I grew up in professionally grew up in a system where the relationships between people were very important um, and understanding each other and understanding each other's role and understanding patients and having relationships to patients uh, were the keystone and we understood that. And then there was a big shift and I was part of this shift of from hospital to community care. In fact, I did a lot of hospital closure programs around learning disabilities and stuff like that. And I really welcomed that shift, to be honest. Um, and it destroys me to see how care in the community has been ripped apart. And it has. It's absolutely, its soul has been ripped out. Uh, it's disgusting. I'm absolutely outraged. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, anyway, I'm not going to get on that soapbox because I'm so angry about it. Um, but I'll stop there, stop myself. Um, but this, the the importance of the relationship between the institution and the community has been vital, you know, since, I suppose, 86, when the um, report came out and Thatcher started acting upon it and started uh, building these services in the community. Um, and I use her name on purpose because people have sort of mixed views about, uh, I don't know, what she was like as a person she was quite sort of strong-minded i guess but she brought about a lot of quite useful changes in health and social care and so for a while we were moving towards a knitting uh, an embedding of those relationships so that people were talking to each other were communicating with each other and i think this natural movement of flow was happening and this sense in which you described leslie that there was a career path it wasn't a silo it was part of a continuum of care of people who needed care. And that seems to have broken down and those relationships seem to have broken down. And I wonder what both of you think about that, the role of relationship and connection between people in terms of care and health in general. Well, that's Anna talk. That's certainly rather a lot. <laughs> I'm sure you've got much uh, better thought out answers than, on this than I do. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose I um I think obviously I'm very early in my career, um, but it's it's even from the kind of humdrum things of not being able to get people out of hospitals. Right. It's, you know, um physiotherapists, it's very hard. A lot of physiotherapists go in private because it's so, you know, badly paid and difficult and stressful and you know, there's not enough care home beds and there's there's all this kind of stuff. So it's very simple stuff, I mean very complicated stuff, very simple stuff of kind of bed blocking. And then there's just the other side of it where you are looking at, um, you know, people who are suffering and whether that's kind of more mentally or, you know, physical health conditions that are just so clearly related to a lack of good social care, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so many things that I, I guess they're not so attractive generally to politicians because they are a long term game you know things that seem like they would be quite simple to introduce that would really benefit the kind of general health of the public possibly in in five ten years rather than by the next um election um but yeah i mean it you know it just seems it's so the nhs and the kind of acute hospital system can't work without a really good functioning social care system and community care system yeah and i would add in there uh, um, a welfare net as well, because we know there's a direct link between ill health and poverty, et cetera. Um, and um, kids who can't get enough food can't learn in school. Um, and so these are real healthcare issues, as far as I can see. Um, you don't have to comment on those, either of you. I could say that because nobody's going to sack me. <laughs> so. No, I agree. I, you know, let's let's make more bike lanes. Let's give, you know, mothers and babies uh you know food health education things let's you know make more green spaces that you know there's so many things that actually would you know get people walking exercising access to good food and you would just yeah. see you know the public health benefits would be enormous yeah. um and the wait times in the nhs for clinics you know. the nhs is just the tip of an iceberg let's have to look at social conditions. And if you look at uh, deprivation, as Michael Marmot does, uh, 
and the impact it has and the variation across the country. Yeah. Uh, mortality rates. Uh, we live in the southeast here. We live uh, five to six years longer than someone in the northeast. Yeah. Old has more illness than someone in the southeast. Uh, they have the lowest level of social care. They have the lowest amount of money going into something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and yet they have the biggest demand. And there's all sorts of uh, problems, unemployment, uh, poverty, uh, poor housing, poor transport. Now, all those areas need something done about them. But we are <laughs> social care of the NHS finish up with having to support. Yes. Uh, I think your point about uh, lack of liaison or working together across the social care NHS divide is horrendous. It's been around a long time and people yeah. have been hard to try and bring them together. There have been a few local initiatives. I used to work at Salford Royal Hospital and we had a chief executive there, David Dalton, who actually was in post for 17 years, which is very unusual for a chief executive, most unusual for three years. And he was able to convince the local authority to give him the budget for local for social care. And he worked the hospital care and social care as one. He employed social workers, employed a district nurses, he employed GPs. Yeah. And the whole service is one uh, for a population of salt of 250,000. It worked very well. Yeah. Uh, integrated care between these two or three elements of care is an aim of the nirvana which it could be aimed at. Governments have tried over the years, but because one is funded by, by the, the local authorities and one is funded by the Department of Health, two different systems yeah. at home. It's been almost impossible to do it. Yet we should be aiming at that. We should be in local initiative. You know, the recent uh, suggestion of uh, integration through uh, what we call the integrated care boards um, that the Department of Health put up, they're really not working. Sorry, people buying into it. They haven't got the the hospitals or the local authorities buying into how they can work together. So it requires local initiatives such as Antonio Salford and actually in Torquay and one or two other places. And we should be building on that. Yeah, absolutely. What's interesting, we are coming to the end of the time. I told you it would fly by. Um and it did. Um what interests me in the conversation so far, I mean there are um, you know, it's not realistic that my, in my podcast we can explore the complexity of the solutions that are needed. And that was a joke at the beginning. Uh, we weren't going to solve the problem of the NHS, although I think we've we've talked about some interesting things and given people an insight. Um, and very much health and well-being are much more than being admitted to a hospital. Um, it's a whole social and political and economic uh, commitment and um, without a doubt all the data points are showing that that commitment to if you like civil society a civilized society is gone and it needs to come back i would just make that as a bold statement i think uh, you don't have to agree or disagree but i will say that and we need to get back to that without a doubt as quickly as possible um but what's interesting me listening to both of you and what's being evoked in me is that from neither of you do I get any sense of cynicism whatsoever, actually. From both of you, what I get is a genuine sense of care and commitment um, that you're you're fully in trying to do something good, right? And trying to do something good within a situation that is not good because mm -hmm. the situation is not good. And I think it's really important. I don't know how you feel about this, but... My sense is, and there was always stuff about, oh, the NHS is in crisis. All my life, the NHS has been in crisis. And to some extent, it's been in crisis because it needed more money. Well, OK, fair enough. I understand that. But it doesn't seem to be to me that that's what's going on at the moment, that the NHS and social care, and no social care more, is definitely very close to collapse as far as I can see. 
right? Is that right? I think it is. I think it's in dire straits. Right. To focus most of our effort. And uh, things can only get better. We have to try harder. To, uh, social care, to me, is the key. It would get people out of hospital quicker. It's almost as hard to get out of hospital as it is to get into hospital at the moment. And to yeah. be able to get them out of hospital, it would stop the ambulance crews, it would stop the crowding in any and departments or places where things were there. But more importantly, or at least equally importantly, it would help all those patients, or those people in the community who are need, in need of social care. Yeah. Times as many of those than, in, than the ones that have been in hospital. And they're the ones that suffer too. Yeah. Hospital is not the right place to treat social disintegration. It's just not the right place. It's the wrong tool. It's the wrong tool for that. Absolutely is. It's the wrong tool to deal with racism and homophobia. It's not a medical issue. It's a social issue. All these things we really need to get to grips with. Uh, but there are, and I would say this from my own perspective as psychology, back with that sort of head on, uh, is that these things, the poverty, the fracturing of society, the increased violence, the increased use of substances, alcohol, et cetera, to try and manage all these stresses and strains that people have, have medical biological consequences and they end up washing up on the shore of acute medicine. That's mm -hmm. what happens, either in the GP surgery or in our sort of A&E departments. We have to be realistic about that, I think. Um, so let's say. I have a chapter in the book about mental health and services for mental health. Yeah. Only two certain things to be in the news recently. Uh, they're struggling. Yeah. Very, and uh, I'm glad Anna's going into psychiatry. And so yeah. We certainly yeah. more clinical psychologists. We certainly need more staff there. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm glad, Anna, because I know personally that she's going into the field. Um, quite an extraordinary human being. And it's great to think that we still can attract this caliber of person into the field. Um, and we're very lucky that we can. And I hope we learn the lesson and stop wasting it. Really, I really do. Um, what we haven't talked about, and it's really, I think people will be fascinated by this, is because the way the news presents these conversations is always just, it's reduced to more money. And neither we have actually talked about money at all. Of course, more money is needed, but it has to be strategically applied. But it's really interesting to me that neither of you have said, well, give me more money. You know, um, obviously money is an issue, but but it doesn't seem to be the primary issue for you both as clinicians. We, we certainly need a bit more money in social care, quite a lot more. The NHS could manage... Um, I, I I will be pilloried if I say the NHS doesn't need more money. Everyone needs more money. Yeah. There's so much more that needs doing and could be done. Yeah. Need more money. And it's unrealistic to expect the government suddenly to find itself in, in uh, the position of being able to do that more money. Won't be able to do that. No, not this mob. <laughs> and if we're prioritising it, it should be going into all right so uh, what i would summarize is uh, is someone who spent his whole life yeah in the hospital so, <laughs> it should go into you know, you're going to get in trouble for that statement leslie i'm afraid that's it your consultant mates are going to be after you um yeah give me more money um look i i, I mean i think that, well it, it lightens my heart talking to both of you um, because the news is so often poor about this area of the UK at the moment. Um, and I remember it being, you know, world beating service. And I'd like us to get back to that because it, it really is a, a treasure and has led the world and should do again. But what heartens me about both of you and particularly about sort of Anna, you're coming into the profession as well, is that we are still attracting people. Um, who have um, commitment, intelligence, professionalism, care, concern, thoughtfulness. Um, and, and those are the things that we want to treasure and make sure that we keep them. Um, and I think it's a really important debate that we should be having. Um, I would certainly 
recommend that people get hold of Leslie's book. I've got it on order from, it's now in Waterstones. It wasn't there last week because I tried, um, but it is there this week because I've tried. Um, so we had 10 copies left and I'm getting one of them, I'm telling you. So I suggest people log on to Waterstones and get a copy of Leslie's book and read it. Um, and let's begin that national debate properly. Let's begin it properly with all this nonsense out of the way. And just we're talking about people who are vulnerable and we're talking about a complicated response to illness and health and well-being uh, mm -hmm. within for British people. And we need to be really grounded in that conversation. OK, um, really lovely to have you both on. Just stay there for now. Unless you've got any last things you want to say, like get lost now, you're an idiot, whatever it is. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead, Lizzie. Oh, I was just saying thank you. Yeah, same. Thank you so much, Noel. That was really great. And Lizzie, it was very, very interesting. And I will obviously be reading your book and I will be carrying it as much foot forward with me as possible. You're taking off to the ward with you, aren't you? Sort of yeah. Like, yeah. Like your shield. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so both of you stay there. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. I hope you've all enjoyed that and got some insight into... Um, what makes our health service amazing, which is the people that work in it. And you met two of the amazing people that work in it today. We're very lucky to have them. We should treasure them, folks. Um, and it is an election year. So use that vote to vote for health and social care, folks. I'm going to say that really clearly. Um, whoever's promising the most on that one, you want to go with them, they get your vote, as far as I'm concerned. Um, all right. Really good to have you. See you all next week and I hope you have a lovely week in between, folks. Bye-bye.